This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. So I lie somewhere between them. Uh, that's John David and he's a history professor at HBU, <laughs> and he's getting very excited, very excited in the in the run up here. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show, John. Yeah, you're welcome, Jay. Good to be back. Good to be back. Yeah. yeah. History Lens. We're going to talk today right. about his the, book, The, the, new the Limits of, of Westernization. The new season of History Lens. We've taken some time off. Yeah. Um, I should be rested. I'm not, but that's <laughs> Sorry okay. Sorry to hear that. You've been writing, that's why. <laughs> yes, I've been writing uh, a lot, actually. And you can see, well, here's, here's the, the fruits of, of some of my writing, and then I've started another book. So, But uh, really? back on, History Lens is back on, and uh, so... Let's uh, do it. Yes, yeah. right on. Well, you know, it's the Santiana thing, and I think it's, it's more poignant now than it ever was. And we, we really can't forget, you know, it's like... It's like History is compressed these days. Yeah, it's like you have yeah. to remember not what happened in the 19th century. You have to remember what happened last month right. because it moved the fickle finger moves so fast. <laughs> <The> fickle finger <laughs> <laughs> that you have to remember everything because people. Yes. there are people. I, I don't want to name names who would like to distract you. Absolutely, no, no. <laughs> Donald Trump is the distractor in chief. I mean, he really he's very good at that. I mean. One of the few things that he's very good at. Oh, they're pardon calling him my, the, the. Pardon my entry into politics, but. Well, it's just, okay. They're just calling my him the, the chief comment. inheritor now. Yeah. Inheritor in chief. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, anyway, let's talk right. about this book. Let's talk right. about this whole notion of westernization. Right. And let's talk about the limits of westernization. Ah, okay, yeah. good, good. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit uh, iconoclastic, isn't it? It is, Didn't actually. We, we went into this century yeah. thinking that the westernization, the western culture was, was going to be ubiquitous everywhere. Right, right, good. So, yeah, you know, I, I think about some of the work that I've done, and I usually don't think about my kind of my genre, my oeuvre as iconoclasm, but I suppose I am a bit of an iconoclasm. Yes, you are, in my kind opinion. Of, kind of picking at uh, paradigms and trying to not just deconstruct them, but, but re-examine them and make sure that we're, we've got the right facts historically on these paradigms. So, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so I started this book because I was traveling to East Asia a lot in the last, mm, the last several years, a lot really the last eight years. Define East Asia. Uh, China, Japan, really. And in fact, I'll be back in Japan again in December. And um, so traveling there, and uh, I mean, I'd been to Japan and saw the, uh, the tremendous achievements of the post-World War II Japanese economy and society, rebuilding Japan, making Japan the number two uh, economic superpower in the world for a long time, and then of course now the number three economic powerhouse. Uh, and that was always very impressive to me, and it always made me wonder, well, can we attribute this success solely to westernization? Is this actually what happened to Japan? Uh, meaning uh, acceptance of western modes of thinking, acceptance of western uh, capitalist economy, acceptance of, well, Actually, in the pre-war period, it would have included Christianity as part of Westernization. Can I throw a nugget at you and see yeah. what you think of it? Yeah. There's a book by the name of uh, Pacific by Simon Winchester. Yes, I know the book well. used to be at, um, at uh, East West Center. Right. And in his early chapter, in a chapter about various stories in the Pacific, yeah. his chapter on Sony tells you so much about this. Right. Uh, these guys were, they were a partnership during the war. They made war material of some kind. And after the war, they decided they better get into something more sexy. So they had heard that yeah. in, North, in Canada, I yeah. want to say Winnipeg somewhere, yeah. some outback place in, yeah. in the middle of Canada, yeah. somebody was playing with something called a transistor. No, that's right. So the company right. sent two young fellows who had some kind of technological interest to Canada yeah. to find out everything they could find by hook or crook, whatever, yeah. about the transistor. And they brought the transistor back. Right. Hence the Sony transistor radio. <laughs> That's right. Query, would Japan have entered the technological age without that? Maybe not. It was not indigenous. It was from Canada. No, that's right. No, it's, it's quite true. So the transistor is very important, actually. Uh, but the way that the Japanese uh, implement or use the transistor in building their economy is very Japanese, actually. Uh, so they build transistor radios, but they don't build them for Japanese. Those first radios that they build, they're for American, for export to the American market. 
Uh, they've, they even, they've measured the size of the, the shirt pocket <laughs> so that the transistor radio can fit in the shirt the pocket. Man. The <laughs> That's man. right. So, so, uh, so I'm not, again, I'm not saying that westernization does not exist, but what I'm trying to do is pull back on the idea that what Asia looks like today, and we can, can we bring up a picture of Tokyo today? Just a, uh, yeah, there, and so that's, a that's Tokyo today, and there's a Mount Fuji in the background. Uh -huh. I mean, look at it. It's this amazing city of 35 million people, and they have a subway which, uh, in, on which about uh, 20 million of that 35 million people travel every day. And when I go there, it's astonishing because there is not a scrap of garbage on that platform for the subway or in, inside the subway cars. It's astonishing what they've achieved. And so it's, look, I think it's conceit and hubris to, to assume that the West created this. Okay, this is a Japanese. This is their thing. This is a Japanese creation. See a creation. lot of homeless in Tokyo? Um, not so much anymore, actually. I, when I was there in 2005, I saw more homeless because, mm. of course, that was, uh, the Japanese were still recovering from that economic collapse sure, they had yes, in 1990, yeah. right. in which they had a full decade of, of flat, zero economic growth. So, yeah. um, so there were actually more homeless then. No, I, I didn't see hardly any homeless uh, when I was there a couple yeah. of years ago. So, so uh, westernization and its limits. So the other thing that I did is I traveled to China. And if we could bring up the picture of Shanghai, I mean, this is, I was blown away by, uh, uh, by China. So this is the Po River and this is Shanghai, modern day Shanghai. And look at it, it's all big towers and it's incredibly wealthy. Uh, and so China has also developed in the post-war period in a way that I think no one anticipated. And we can pretty well be assured that it wasn't the West because the West cut off relations with China in the, uh, in the 1940s because of the, the Civil War and the victory of the Chinese Communist Party. There was nobody to relate to. That, that's <laughs> right. I mean, there wasn't much influence for coming from the West because the Chinese and the West were at loggerheads. So, so these two things, it did, as I was thinking about the book, uh, there, were other, some, so, there were some other sources of kind of the generating thoughts of it. But as I was thinking about the book, I thought, how is it? that we still today ascribe to East Asian modernity, this thing that they built, and modernization of Westernization, that the West was responsible for all of this. So that was my departure point. That was my point of inquiry. If, if, if it ever existed, if there was ever a significant Western influence on Asia, East Asia anyway, yeah. that's not the case anymore. You go there, and you go to either either Tokyo or uh, or or uh, Shanghai, especially. Right, right. The, the the vitality is is palpable. Oh yeah. There's so much energy right. going on. It blows right. you away. Oh, yeah. The and speed at which things move is exactly. so much faster than and, any American city. And, and what surprised me the most, of, I was in Beijing first and then in Shanghai. What surprised me the most about the Chinese is they were all trying to sell me something. <laughs> I thought, what happened to the Cultural Revolution, right, in the, in the 1960s? And high noble idea. <laughs> you know, the capitalist rotors. Now they're all capitalists trying to sell something. So that was astonishing to me. And that was part of it. So, so that was uh, the way the book started. Now, of course, when you write a book like this, you have to give some papers at conferences and so <laughs> this is also interesting so in 2014 I was in Savannah Georgia giving a paper at a world history conference so a friend of mine a colleague of mine steps up to me and he says oh I saw your you know the title of your paper I was giving a paper on John Dewey in China John uh, Dewey yes in China? yes the great uh, educational philosopher yeah, John Dewey early early 20th century spent two years in China from 1919 to 1921 uh -huh. he was planning on going for six weeks and he canceled his uh, return and decided to stay because wow. he was so excited about yeah, China, about the yeah. energy of China. I mean, part of his excitement was, at that moment, the May 4th movement, which was this movement of intellectuals who were, trying, who were critical of Western imperialism in China and trying to, uh, trying to create a new China had emerged. Mm -hmm. It emerged, actually. John Dewey arrives on May 1st. And the May 4th movement, of course, starts on May 4th, three days later. So it was quite, <laughs> a, right in the thick of things. It was quite a time to be in China, yeah. 
So, so I, I'm talking to this colleague and he says, well, John Dewey had all this influence in China. And the paper was about just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> that, so when we look at John Dewey's influence in China during, his, during and after his, uh, his two years there, he, Dewey went and he gave a lot of speeches and, you know, uh, and, and there was big crowds. About to, education. Yeah, about, about all kinds of things, actually. Really about national development and, and nationalism, all kinds of different topics, including education. Uh, and so Dewey... Uh, uh, it's, it was assumed by scholars because he had these big crowds that he had tremendous influence in China. But when you read more carefully into uh, how the Chinese responded to Dewey, it, for the, about the first year in, in 1919 into early 1920, he did have some influence. And in the second year, he, did, he hardly had any influence they at all. They were having an influence on him. They were having, in <laughs> fact, that's also true, is that Dewey becomes very enamored of, of Chinese Confucianism mm -hmm. and, and later refers indirectly to Chinese Confucianism in, uh, in a book about democracy. In, in the chapter of the title is The Great Community, and this is a pretty clear reference to the Confucian ideal of the family in the community. So can you help me with uh, understanding, you know, what happened in the early part of the 20th century in China, you know, with the spheres of influence in Shanghai, yeah, right. with, the, with the fall right, of, sure, of the emperor, sure. and then, you know, essentially the decline of China right, right. Uh, as a power that influenced others and as a power that became subject to influence, right. and then ultimately, you know, yeah. here we are. Yeah, so, so the context there, the context of John Dewey's trip is that China is under the influence of spheres of what we call spheres of influence, where the, the main Western powers, the French, the British, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Japanese, uh, formerly the, the Germans, but then the Germans had to withdraw after, were forced to withdraw during World War I. The Americans all have areas of China where they, they are strong and influential. They all have their own military forces in China. And they all have advisors to the Chinese government in this time period. So it's a time period. The Chinese refer to this as a century of humiliation. Yeah. Starting in... Well, uh, foreign forces on your own soil. That's right. Starting in 1842 with the end of the Opium Wars, when China was forced by the British to sign an unequal treaty, which was very severe. It was very favorable to the British and very severe for the Chinese. So. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the, so the Chinese think about this time period and their decline in this time period as a, a humiliation. Hu humiliation by the West. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded um, of a neighborhood in Shanghai called, are you ready? Chinatown. Yeah. There's a neighborhood in Shanghai called <laughs> yeah, Chinatown. Yeah, <laughs> there was also Germantown and so, Right, so, US so and this English is the thing all. about Shanghai. There was a big international settlement in yeah. Shanghai. So yeah. all of the major powers had... Uh, they had military personnel, they had uh, uh, diplomats, they had uh, schools in the international settlement, missionaries. Uh, so, uh, so the West had a very big, uh, you know, they, were, they had a very big presence in China. And that was still true in 1919 when John Dewey went to China. Yeah. And uh, Emperor had uh, been deposed by then. Well, yeah, the, the emperor uh, steps down in, uh, not, he's, he's, there's, a, there's a coup in 1911. Mm. So eight years earlier, the emperor is kicked out and China now has a Republican government, although it's a very unstable government. So, so yeah, so at this conference, back to, back to <coughs> pardon me, back to uh, uh, Savannah, Georgia, at this conference, uh, I had to say to this guy, actually, that's not true at all. John Dewey didn't have that much influence in China. And when we look back, at Dewey's influence after he went back to the United States. Then, really, most scholars dismissed him. Uh, there were a few educational scholars who embraced his ideas. The, the radicals in China denounced him completely. In fact, after World War II, uh, uh, there were uh, a number of radicals who were, who were former Dewey scholars who were forced to recant and denounce Dewey as a capitalist rotor and his ideas as, you know, as anti-communist and dangerous ideas. So. Intellectual conversation. That was the, the, the sign of the times. Well, that's ultimately right. Ultimately leading to the revolution. That's right, right. So, yeah, so, 
So, so John Dewey's influence is not as great as we thought it was. Yeah. That's part of the theme of the book. We're going to go on to the rest of the book in one minute right. after we take this okay. short break. That's John David. All Hatt. right. History lens. <laughs> <laughs> This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread and kissed them all soundly and put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Minasan, konnichiwa. Think Tech Hawaii ga Nihongo de Otodakesuru. Konnichiwa Hawaii. No, Nihongo Hoso no Kosto, Kunisue Yukari des. Kakushu gets you be no Nijikara, Otodakeshte imas. Nihongo community, Hawaii no Nihongo community ni Bendi na Otaske Joho. ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組です。こんにちは、ハワイ。各週の月曜日2時から、ぜひ皆さん見てください。ポストの国瀬ゆかりでした。アロハ。Oh, okay. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's so nice to see you, Kari Kunasui. <laughs> She's one of our hosts. Um, so, John, yeah. you talked about, you know, the need to write papers, present them right. at various right. historic con right. his his history conferences right. around the country right. as a sort of a ramp up for the book. That's right. What, were there others that uh, yeah, along so, the same so, line? So I'm talking to this guy in Savannah, and I really felt like I wanted to push him over the stairs or, or over the railing, <laughs> but I didn't, fortunately, okay? Because, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, this is what I'm fighting against, right? Yeah. So two years later, I give a paper in Boston at a world history conference, and this time there's a scholar from who's European, she's Danish, from China. She teaches at Lingnan University in Hong Kong. Uh, and, and we were talking about my book, because I was working on it, and we were talking about China, and she said, well, everything stays the same in China. And it just kind of blew me away, because this is a, this is a terrible Western stereotype about Chinese history, is that during the time period of the emperor, then everything stayed the same. Nothing changed in China. So we were sitting around having drinks, actually, and I probably had drunk a little too much, and I challenged her quite vociferously <laughs> at that point. Um, but so what ha well, the point here is that it's not just me saying that we assume that westernization is, is, is the narrative. It's actually other scholars who have confirmed this, that their belief is that westernization is powerful and this, this idea of western stereotypes about uh, China are very powerful. So. Um, so, the, I wanted to break through that, and so I decided that the best way to do that was to do th three different things. The first thing is go back and look at East Asians. Try to uncover what their stories were. And, and the book is about intellectuals, so I'm really focusing on intellectuals. So I did that, the first couple chapters. Then I turned to Americans, as we were talking about with John Dewey, I turned to Americans to look at how Americans were interacting in East Asia and how much influence they really had. Because we have also ascribed to Americans who went to East Asia a great, uh, you know, a great deal of influence. Um, and so I looked at that as well and was able to find quite a bit of evidence that we've overstated the influence of people like John Dewey, Charles Beard, et cetera. Um, so, and then the third part of this is I wanted to look at the scholarship after, during and after World War II to try to figure out how we came to this paradigm of westernization. And I think I uncovered the answer is that the paradigm of westernization started with a couple of very important scholars, uh, John K. K. Fairbank, who was a China specialist, Edwin O. Reischauer, who was a Japan specialist, who became the most important scholars uh, in the field of East Asian studies. Uh, uh, Edwin O. Reischauer became ambassador to China in the 1960s, so he became very powerfully, powerful politically in addition to his academic power. So, so their line was that, especially Reischauer is arguing that the United States modernized Japan. He, he, doesn't, he makes no bones about it in, in the first three books that he writes after World War II, that this is the case. I was, was kind of blown away by it, but there it was. It was very clear evidence that this paradigm of westernization 
it, it's not that they invented it, but it received a very big boost by these very important scholars and entered the mainstream of American thought. Well, post-war, you know, we were on a, we were on a path of, uh, of um, greatness. Yes. Um, the greatest generation. Right. Uh, the whole notion that you know, the America had saved the world. Right. So it's right. all consistent no, with that. No, that's right. That's right. So, so and that's right. But the, what, what Reichauer does is he projects this backward into the late 19th century. Mm. And there's, he makes some very kind of careless arguments without much evidence. So I go back and I trace back those arguments and then I refute those arguments with evidence. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's, so the United States did have influence. This is why the book is called The Limits of Westernization, not Westernization Never Happened, <laughs> right? Let's be real. Yeah, it's, the, it's the, about- There were limits. Right, that's right. As I said, I was at this conference in Istanbul this summer where I presented a version of the book and, and the younger scholar said, well, let's just get rid of the word Westernization. And I said back, look, Westernization is real. It actually happened. And, and part, you know, the West was at various times was quite powerful. Mm. So, um, yeah, so we can't eliminate that as an analytical framework. It's just that we've overstated it. Well, and as time goes by, uh, it seems to me the notion of Westernization in the context of uh, East Asia is, is, is less so. Right. They, they, they found their niche. They right. found their groove. Right. Uh, they don't care much about no, following right. us. We should be following them in so many ways. Yeah, we could be looking at the 21st century as the Asian century. Yeah. Okay, let's see how it plays yeah. out. But quite honestly, China looks a lot stronger in some areas than the United States does right now. So There was a, there was a, a, a talk at the East-West Center on Tuesday night by a fellow in the Freeman Foundation. Yeah. My name of Christopher Johnson, and he spoke about Xi Jinping, who was taking this to all kinds of new levels. Right, right, you know, right. President for life or whatever he is. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, you got one belt, one road. Right. Uh, you got a big navy squashing all the religions. Right. Making socialism the state religion in yeah. every which way. Yeah. Uh, developing more on the economy. You name it. Yeah. Uh, they are yeah. going to. They have their own development bank. New levels. No. Yeah. yeah. And and geo. Yeah. Geo uh, political uh, right. initiatives like right. forcing, uh, well, taking control of the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, the uh, the South China Sea, taking yes, control that's of right. it. That's right. I mean, yeah. this is amazing yeah. what's happening, yeah. and it's very quick. Yes, it's happened in relative terms very very quickly. So yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, China's become very powerful, and uh, Xi Jinping has kind of established. Uh, a narrative whereby China is actually the one supporting trade in the world, not the United States. So they've entered, and di diplomatically, uh, and we'll talk more about this later in, in another show, but China has entered the strategic void that, that the Trump administration created with its chaotic approach to East Asia in the first two years. So China has entered that. They've, uh, they've signed agreements with the Philippines about the oil in the South China Sea. These are unprecedented actually. They're negotiating with Japan about better trade relations. Uh, so they're working in areas and they're, they're moving into areas diplomatically that the United States has, has basically, we haven't abandoned, but we've really damaged those, uh, some of those relationships. I mean, we're talking about tariffs on Japan now, the possibility. Our best buddy in yeah, Asia. Right, the only, really the only partner we have left. So. Uh, so this is a problem, yeah. uh, but let let's leave that to a, to a later. Yeah, uh, because we have to see session. how this affects the U.S. That's, and what the U.S. Right. can do, but not today. That's, that's right. So we'll move to that. Right. So so when I started thinking about who I should study uh, in terms of intellectuals who were very important, then Fukuzawa Yukichi is uh, kind of top of top of my head. And so can we bring up the picture of Fukuzawa? There's a couple of pictures here. It's very interesting. Okay, so this is Fukuzawa Yukichi. He's a young samurai who is traveling with, an Amer with a Japanese embassy to the United States in 1860. And he's actually, this photograph, he's, stand he's sitting next to the daughter of the photographer. <laughs> I don't know how she got in the picture, but, <laughs> but uh, so she She's got in the Howley picture. Woman. <laughs> and you look at Fukuzawa, he's very unhappy. I mean, he looks very unhappy about this, defensive, insecure. This actually is a good kind of description of Japan in that time period. Yeah, in yeah. 1860, they were defensive, they were insecure. Now, if we bring up the next picture of Fukuzawa. 
okay, this is Fukuzawa as a, as a more mature man, more self-confident as somebody who is beginning to write about uh, East Asian, about you Japan. You can see the difference. John. You can. He's, he's, he's really in control. He's poised and everything. So pictures, in this case, That's are so worth interesting. a thousand yeah. words. Yeah. So, so Fukuzawa uh, becomes an intellectual. After these trips, he returns, he starts to write, he writes about the West, but he also writes books about Japan. He writes two very important books in the 1870s in which he's arguing that Japan has to get out of this old system that it's in. This, this is a critical time for Japan. It, this is when they adopted all these uh, Western technologies, te telephone, exactly, telegraph, exactly. Uh, what else was there, street lights, all that, yep, all, it all yep. was coming. That's right. And they, they modernized their economy, but they also centralized their government. They got rid of the samurai. Uh, they developed an educational system, a mandatory education system. So they became a modern nation almost overnight. Uh, and there was some Western influence in that, but really it's a Japanese creation. And so Fukuzawa's contribution to this is to argue that what the Japanese citizenry needs is to be independent. They need to think with independence. They, don't, they need to throw off that old, what Fukuzawa called the old rank system, because of course in the old system you had to blindly follow whatever your lord said, or else he could execute Which you. was futile. That's right, this is uh, the feudal Tokugawa system. So, so Fukuzawa said, hey, let's get rid of that and let's think like independent citizens. And then if we do that, we will have an independent nation which can fight off uh, the, the threat from the was, West. That was seen as westernization, right? Uh, no, I mean, really, this idea of, of independence actually is probably more connected to another uh, person that we'll talk about. Maybe if we have time, we'll talk about uh, Wang Yongming who is a Neo-Confucian, who argued that, uh, it, that within Confucianism there is the possibility of denying your master, denying your lord, if it's for the sake of the nation. This was a major change. No? That's right, that's right. And Wang Yangming himself is a very interesting guy, so, uh, so we can, uh, if we have time, we'll talk about him. So Fukuzawa is arguing that the Japanese people, as citizens, need to be more independent-minded. This is a major innovation in thought for the Japanese And it was people. essential to and, industrialize, and that, and to do entrepreneurial well, development. Well, loyal to the nation, yes, but to become good citizens, they should be independent thinkers, and they should be committed to the nation as well. Yeah, yeah. Hence, yeah. hence no trash on the streets of Tokyo. That's right, that's right, <laughs> yes, cohesion. And, and so that's one of, so it's interesting, Fukuzawa's books actually become so popular that peasants in the countryside are joining study groups and his books are being read to them because a lot of these peasants are illiterate. But in the 1870s there are study groups in, in Japanese villages for yeah, Fukuzawa's books. You're talking about Ming. Ming is Chinese. Right, right, but this is, uh, so, okay, let me clarify that. Wang Yang Ming is an ancient sage from the 1500s in okay. China, but his thought had moved to Japan. Okay. Yeah, okay. so uh, so you the most interesting time. Well, I'd say it's a good time to break, actually. Okay, okay. We're out of time. But okay, I, well, I hope we can stop. continue right from this point. Okay, we'll stop. On, yeah. on through the, you know, the turn yeah. of that century, yes. on through the turn of the next century, yes. and where we are today okay, we with will. the United States. We will. John David okay. and history professor, History Lens. How exciting, <laughs> always. We're Thank back. You, We're back. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for doing Thanks, this. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. <laughs>